Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn in them to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15 again. And we'll continue that series. We'll share communion at the end. Um, before we do that, has anyone not got something to take communion with? You know, I've got some communion stuff here. Yeah. Has anyone else? Everyone sorted? We'll share that at the end. We've been looking at this series, haven't we, on Luke 15, on the three, the three parables of Jesus. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking specifically at the last one of the prodigal son. And last week, we started looking at the gifts that the, the prodigal son was given once he had returned home. And I was saying that these gifts that he received were symbolic and in one way they were symbolic to him because they weren't just gifts, they, they represented something of the restoration that he was receiving from his, his father. But in another more important way they're symbolic to us because they're a picture of what God does for us when we come to him in repentance and confession, when we are restored to him. And we kicked this off last week by looking at the robe that was placed over the son's shoulders, and how in particular this robe would have began to, to cover him, it would have began to cover the, the sort of starved, pig-stained person that he had become. He'd just come out of famine, he, he was skint, he was so destitute that he had to come home just for something to eat. And this robe would have, would have covered something of, of what he had begun to look like. And we see a bit of a glimpse in that of, of not how God only deals with our sin but removes the shame of that sin as well, that shame that we carry and walk in. Well today we're going to keep on looking at the robe that the Son was given and, and some of the different things that that means for us. Last week we looked at the robe of covered shame. This week I want us to look at the robe of Christ's righteousness. So once again, Luke 15 if you want to follow along, we're going to be reading from verse 17. When he had come to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have got food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. Now I'll set out, and I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm going to say to him, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran out to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you once again for this incredible parable that Jesus told us, this, this incredible picture that he has given us of, of grace and reckless living God, how reckless living we can be restored from it, a picture of the Father's love and a son's redemption. Speak to us today, God in a very personal and powerful way, God. You know what each and every one of us needs to hear this morning. You know where each and every one of us is at. Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit has his way, that we would leave here a little bit more changed, a little bit more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week we looked at how the robe that his father given him would have acted as a covering and while we use clothes to cover our nakedness, his robe was used to cover his duckiness. But there's another purpose for clothes, isn't there? Clothes don't just cover what's underneath, but they also project something outwardly. The clothes we wear tell a story, don't they? Think of a, a nurse's uniform, a graduation gown, a, a preacher's dog collar, 
the clothes we wear tell people something about us. And as I'm saying this, I'm starting to think maybe I should have put a shirt on this morning. But whether it's ripped jeans or smart trousers, whether it's a three-piece suit or a high-vis jacket, whether it's something sporty or grungy or florals or, or whatever it is, the stuff we wear says something about us. Just take a second and look at the people around you. Just, just fix your eyes on someone else in the room. Imagine you had to switch wardrobes with that person for a week and wear what they had to wear. You might not like that very much. It's not to say that what that person's wearing is hideous, but you might not like it very much because what they're wearing just, well, it's not you. We choose what we wear quite carefully because in a way, it represents us. Before we say anything to people, what we are wearing often says something for us. It says something about us. And the Bible often leans on this to make a point. Time and time again in Scripture, we see that a person's clothing is used to make a statement to the other people around them. And, and I think that's a little bit of what we're seeing here. The father in this parable, he, he's not given his son this robe because the son's really cold. I see a few ladies in here, and you've got your robes wrapped around you. Um, I don't know if that's just a prophetic image of what we're speaking about today, or if you're just really cold. You're next to the radiator, so I'm guessing you're maybe, maybe a bit cold. But, but I don't think the father in this story gave him this robe because he's cold. He's given it to send a message both to the son himself and to anyone else who's going to see him. And if that's the case, we need to ask, well, what message is he sending here? What, what message is being heard by the Jews and the Pharisees who are sitting listening to Jesus telling this story? And, and what message should we be taking away from this too? What is God saying to us? I think there's a few things for us that we can take away from this. Let me just start to, to mention a couple I think for the Jews who are sitting listening to this parable, for the people that Jesus is primarily making this point to, the, the first thing in my mind that, that they would have thought about was a connection with Joseph. Do you remember Joseph in the Bible? Joseph was a, a, young, a young brat and he had 11 older brothers. His dad loved him. His dad loved him. In fact, his dad loved him more than all the other sons because... Not because he was so much better, but because he was born to the woman that his dad was in love with. And, and he, he, Joseph was just his favourite. So what did he do? He made him a coat of many colours. We've all heard that story, haven't we? Some of these might even have been to see the musical. This is Harrogate, after all. The lover theatre. Joseph was given a coat of many colours as, as, a, as a symbol, as a sign of how much his father loved him. It was a physical sign of the favour that Joseph held in his eyes. And, and I think we get that, don't we? Sometimes the Bible makes complicated points, but I think we get this. It's, it's fairly simple. We understand that picture. I think about Elsie. You know, before Elsie was even born, Lauren's sister came down and, and gave her loads of outfits that she had bought, loads of little baby outfits. And, and we were surprised at how much stuff Lauren's sister had bought her. But then we were surprised at the quality of the stuff she had bought. She bought all these wee outfits for all these fancy shops that we don't shop in. And I'm looking at it and thinking, some of these wee outfits, some of this baby gear is like 30 quid each. You know, just for a bib, just for a pair of tights or something. And I says, you don't need to bother her. You know, she's, she'll wear it five minutes and she'll puke in it. And then a month later, she'll have grown out of it. But she never stopped. She keeps on, whenever she gets her something, she gets her a, a really expensive piece of clothing, something branded, something, something kind of fancy. And, and she's not just doing it. She's not doing it so that Elsie wears it and thinks, oh, I'm really loved by my auntie. She's doing it so that the people who see her go, that wee baby's loved. You know, somebody thinks the world of her. 
somebody thinks a lot hard to go out and buy her this stuff. We, we get that picture, don't we? The coat of many colours thing is an expression of love. That's what we see in Joseph's story, and that's what we see here with the prodigal son too. We see the father draping this robe over his son's shoulders as a sign that this son, as much of a wronging as he was, has his love and has his favour. That's, in my mind, that's the kind of most obvious thing that would jump out when I hear this story. There's another reflection of the Old Testament as well. It's a reflection of Esther's uncle, Mordecai. Uh, maybe a less well-known story. Mordecai found favour in the king's eyes. So the king asked this question. He says, what should the king do for someone whom he wishes to honour? And the answer that the king got was that he should, he should dress the man in a royal robe. In a robe that the king himself has worn. And then let the people of the city see him wearing it. Being allowed to wear something that the king had worn was a sign to the entire city that Mordecai had found favour in the eyes of the king. He, was, he, he had the king's respect and being given a robe that the king himself had worn had instantaneously lifted his status in society. Instantaneously lifted him in the eyes of his peers. No longer was he just Mordecai, the queen's uncle. Now he was Mordecai, the man whom the king had raised up. And again, in this parable, when the father calls for the robe to be placed on his son, he doesn't just call for a robe or any robe. He says, bring the best robe. Bring the best one we have, the best one in the house, probably the one that the father himself wore because he was the head of the house. And again, it's a statement, it's a message to all of those who are looking on, to all of those who are going to see this son, that yeah, the son was lost, yeah, he's made some mistakes, but he's back now. And the father is raising him up, he's lifting him up back to his rightful position of sonship. These are a couple of the sort of more obvious connections that we see to this parable, the more historical connections, which I think the people listening to Jesus would have thought of immediately. They would have got the, the symbolism and the imagery that Jesus was talking about here. But there's something else here too, something that I think is, is more significant for us. And it's another picture from the Old Testament that Jesus is listening us may have made the connection to. And it's the Old Testament prophetic theme that one day God was going to clothe his people with robes of righteousness. Let me just explain where this comes from. Two different prophecies. Speaking about the time when the Messiah would one day come, Isaiah 61 10 says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and he has covered me with robes of righteousness. Isaiah was prophesying about the day when the Messiah would come and God himself would bestow salvation and righteousness upon his people. And, and for the people at Israel who, who are hearing this, this is an extraordinary expectation. You've just got to sort of, you've just got to understand how, how out of the box this is. Because see, for the Jewish people, righteousness wasn't something you were given. It was something you attained. It was something you worked towards and held on to through rigid obedience to the law, perfect obedience to the law. Those who those who never put a, a foot out of place, those who never made a mistake, who, who met every sacrifice and followed every ritual and, and done everything to the T, those were the ones who were seen as righteous. But here the prophet Isaiah is saying that when the Messiah comes, when Jesus comes, salvation and righteousness would not be earned, but it would be given. And that almost sounds too good to be true. 
And perhaps for some of the Jewish people who heard these prophecies, they, they did think it was too good to be true. And perhaps that's why, just a couple of years later, God doubles down on this. He doubles down on this with a prophecy from Zechariah. And this one's into a wee bit more detail, so bear with me. I'm just going to read it to you. And I'll kind of show you the connection. Zechariah 3, verse 1. In his vision, he says this, The Lord showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is this man not a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in, dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off your filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put you now in rich robes. This is a bit of a strange scene, and, and sometimes these visions that we get are a little bit all over the place and a little bit hard to, to make out. But let me just try and help you with this. It, it helps if you visualise this scene thinking about a courtroom, thinking about a court. We see Joshua, who is the high priest of Israel in this, and he's the defendant. He, he's in the dock, he's on trial, and he represents Israel's righteousness, Israel's right standing with God. But unfortunately, he's standing there wearing filthy rags, which is a symbol of, of Israel's wickedness, Israel's sinfulness. Standing at the side of him is Satan, the devil, whose uh, prosecution he's there to accuse him. Standing at the other side of him is the angel of the Lord, which is, which is a picture of Jesus Christ. Before Christ was born, we see Christ in this form as the angel of the Lord. Standing there is the defence. And then we have God, the Lord God, the Father God, sitting as judge in this courtroom. And that, that's kind of the picture that he's painting here. It's a picture that we understand from the Old Testament. But it's also a picture of, of kind of the Christian life, isn't it? You know, we've got Satan who's, who's opposing us, Christ who's defending us, and God who's judging us. This is the scene that we're seeing here. And then all of a sudden, three things happen. First of all, God rebukes Satan. He silences the prosecution, silences the accuser. Second, the angel removes Joshua's filthy rags, which was the sinfulness. And third of all, the filthy rags are replaced by rich robes, which represent the righteousness. And again, we're seeing sin and righteousness pictured as clothes. Again, this is a picture of what the Messiah is going to accomplish when the day of the Lord comes. Other than in Isaiah and Zechariah, we don't hear much about this anymore. We don't hear anything else about this prophecy. It's only those two guys that pick up on that theme until Jesus comes and then Luke 15 He's sitting down with some Jews and some Pharisees telling this parable and all of a sudden he begins to paint the picture of a half-starved, pig-stained, sinful boy returning home in shame and iniquity and his father runs up to him and throws the best robe over his shoulder. And for those who are sitting there today, the picture would have been clear. For those of us who are sitting here today, the picture very much is Yes, the robes are a symbol of God's love for you. He puts over you just, just as they were for Joseph. Yes, the robes are a picture of how God is calling us and raising us up, just like he did for Mordecai, who was honoured by the king. But more than anything, more than anything for us here today, these are a picture of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that he has credited to those who have put their faith in him. Because when we come to him in humility, when we come to him in repentance and in confession, not only does he remove the rags of iniquity that we're wearing, but he imputes to us his very own righteousness. We, we talk a lot, don't we, about, about forgiveness. You know, Christ forgave my sins. Hallelujah, he took my sins away. I'm forgiven. But we forget that our side of that 
If your life was a bank account, not only did Jesus Christ wipe clean the debt of sin that you owed, not only did he wipe away the deficit that you were in, but he credited your account. He made a deposit of the righteousness of God. He didn't just take away the rags, he put on robes of righteousness. And, and we often we often forget that bit. Jesus took his own righteousness, his own right standing with God, and gives it to those who put their faith in him. Second Corinthians 5.21 puts it like this. He says, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin, to become sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ puts on your sin like a jacket so that you can put on his righteousness like a jacket. Which means that when God looks at you, when God looks at you, you are as righteous in his eyes as Jesus Christ is himself. That sounds a little bit mind-blowing for me. Almost sounds heretical. God sees us as righteous as he sees Jesus because the righteousness that we are standing in, the righteousness that we are clothed in, is not our own and has never been our own. But it's his. And many of us, even long-standing Christians, I think, struggle to accept this. People struggle to sometimes get it in our head, don't we? We get it in our head, but we don't often get it in our heart. And I think part of the reason for that is because in each of these scenes that we've looked at, there's always an accuser. Remember Zechariah's prophecy? Satan was in the room to the prosecution, the accuser. In the prodigal son, there's an accuser. The older brother, the father forgives them and welcomes them home, but the older brother's still in the field. That son of yours did this and did that. There's always an accuser. Mordecai had Haman. Even Joseph had his older brothers who stole away from him the robe that his father had given him. Think about that. The physical symbol of his father's love that was given to him, his, his brothers and accusers ripped it from him. And, and this is what the devil tries to do with us all the time. He tries to take from us that knowledge and that belief and that revelation that God loves us, that God's called us, that God has made us righteous. You need to remember that the devil is always trying to get in your head. He's always telling you that you are not loved. He's always telling you that you're not chosen, that you're not called, that you're not being raised up. He's always telling you that, you know what, you're not really forgiven. You're forgiven for some of it, but you're not forgiven for that. And those robes that you're standing in really are just filthy rags. It's funny, sometimes it doesn't matter how long you've been walking in faith, how long you've been a follower of Jesus, sometimes you just get days where you just feel rotten, and you feel dirty, and you feel like a failure, and you feel like a fraud, and you feel like somehow you're not really a proper Christian. Where do you think that comes from? These are the lies and the accusations that Satan fires at us all the time. But the, the beauty of what Christ has done, the beauty of the robes of righteousness that he has given us, is that they silence the enemy. Remember, God did three things in Zechariah's prophecy. He took away the robes of sinfulness. He gave the robes of righteousness. And he silenced the accuser. He said, Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. And in the robes of righteousness that Christ has given us, we don't need to defend them. They defend us. Because it's never been our righteousness. If, if it was, if it, if, if it was our own works that we're standing on, if it was our own deeds that we're standing on, if it was our own 
perfect obedience to the law that we're standing on, then we would have no chance against the enemy and his lies and his accusations. But the righteousness that we are standing in as followers of Jesus is not bought, earned, or won by anything that you will ever do. It's given by him. And because there's no accusation that Satan can bring against Jesus Christ, there's none that he can bring against you either. Which is most likely why Paul the Apostle says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you ever feel condemned? Do you ever feel like you've been made to feel dirty? Like a fraud? Like a fake Christian? Like, like you're not really forgiven? You're not really there like other people are there? That's a lie. And there's no truth in it. The truth is in what Jesus Christ has done. That he has wiped away your sin and credited to you the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to become sin. So that in him we would become the righteousness of God. Father, we thank you again for this parable, God. We thank you, God. Sometimes when we when we talk about this stuff, it can sound a bit conceptual. It can sound a bit lofty. Trying to understand, God, the things that you have done in the spiritual. So, Lord, I just pray that for each and every one of us this morning that we would receive a revelation of the righteousness that you have given us. Not just a revelation of the forgiveness of the wiping away of the debt that we have, God, but a revelation of what you have given in its place. And as much as you became sin for us, we have been made the righteousness of God for his pleasure. Give us that revelation that when God looks at us, he doesn't see filthy rags. He doesn't see our mistakes. He sees your sacrifice. He sees the goodness and the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus Christ that has been given to us. Give us that revelation this morning of the Father putting that robe around us that shields us from accusation, that changes the game, that changes what we are, who we are. In his name. Amen. Amen. We'll share communion now. We'll ask our music group to come back up.
We thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you for the suffering of Jesus, for the punishment that he took upon himself, for the, the guilt that he took upon himself, God, so that we might be freed from it. We thank you for everything that means for us. Even the parts of it we don't fully understand. Even the parts of it that are head knowledge and not yet heart knowledge. We thank you for what you have done. For the finished work of Jesus Christ. We thank you even if we come under accusation. Even if we experience things like guilt and shame. We can come back to the truth of the matter. That what you have done stands above it all. We just pray, Father, that, that is the revelation. Give us that heart knowledge this morning. Amen.